Dina, Dale, we've talked about witches. We've talked about the town of Sleepy Hollow. Have you guys heard about all of the horrific murders that have happened in the area of Sleepy Hollow? I've heard far too many to count. I've definitely heard my fair share, but I'm very curious. Well, we're going to investigate those stories today on Folktown. This week on Folktown, Sleepy Hollow, a town that's anything but sleepy. Welcome to Folktown. Welcome back, residents of Folktown. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about a little bit of a sensitive topic. This episode's going to mention some murders that have taken place in the area as well as victims and both perpetrators that are buried in the cemetery of Sleepy Hollow. So up top, we just want to make sure that we are letting you guys know that we are cognizant of the fact that these acts are awful and still affecting the family members. And we just want to let you know that we're not glorifying the act or the people that committed them. We are here more to honor the victims and tell their stories. I do just want to say that last week's episode was a lot of fun about the witches. I don't know how you guys felt, but I really loved that episode. This episode is definitely in my wheelhouse because we are going to be talking about murders. Definitely a lot darker tonight. Again, that's kind of why we put that disclaimer up front. We are recognizing that um, sometimes these things should come with trigger warnings and they don't. And sometimes uh, people glorify the murderers and that's not what we're trying to do. We just want to tell the stories, especially for this area, which we did not realize until we started researching how many murders have occurred in the area or how many people that have been murdered or committed murders are married in the cemetery. I don't know about you guys, but I was pretty shocked to find all these stories. It was hard to dwindle it down. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, the the further you go back, it really does get a little wild, you know, yeah. that it's just like, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. This, okay, this sounds like it could have happened within the past 20 years. Oh, wait, there's still like 50 years back. Oh, wait, we could keep going back to like oh 1700s. My gosh. 1800s. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And this is not for, you know, like sometimes when we're doing episode research, not that we're having to look hard for reputable sources or reputable stories. This one was the opposite. It was like dwindling down even right before we hit record. We're like, oh, I just found this one. Oh, I just found this one. And so kind of dwindling it down to the three larger stories we're going to tell up front before our story. It was really hard. So I think all of our stories kind of take place pre pre 2000, guys. We we tried to go back much further, especially to be sensitive of newer stories. But I'll I'm going to go ahead and start. So this yeah, one how, how is how far about back Malcolm. are we starting with? <laughs> we're starting back, my friends. Okay. So we're starting with Malcolm Webster Ford. He was born just a couple years ago in Brooklyn, um, February seventh of eighteen sixty two. So just a couple couple years ago. Just fresh, you know. Just a few. Uh huh. He was an athlete and he was a journalist, and he was the son of Gordon Lester Ford and Emily Webster Ford. Emily Webster Ford was actually the granddaughter of Noah Webster, who was a lifelong friend of Emily Dickinson. Love that. Which us Ooh. book nerds love. But during the 1800s, he won the American national champion as the all around athlete in what would be equivalent today as a decathlon. And he won that three times and it had 10 events. This just makes me tired thinking of this, but mm-hmm. three of which, <laughs> which are different than what are run today. He, he, were, he ran a lot of races and he was very well known for that. He ended up marrying an heiress. Her name was Jeanette Graves. Uh, they got married in 1893 and they had one child who was also named Malcolm Webster Ford. So the couple divorced in 1898. And oddly enough, which is very strange for this time period, it's, I mean, honestly, even strange for the current time period, but the couple divorced in 1898 and Ford, he was granted custody of their child. Hmm. And that's not normally how it goes. So during this time period, he was like a businessman, kind of, uh, he was a journalist, I would say. He's a journalist, maybe self-proclaimed. Do you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm. He wrote articles about track and field, obviously, because that's what he was known for. And his heyday, and he published them in an, a magazine called The Outing. So he tried to launch his own publications twice. Both of them f- were failures. Mm. They plummeted. And then in um, on May 8th in 1902, 
So before I get to the bad part of the story, he was asking his brother for a lot of money because he just kept having these business ventures that kept failing and failing and failing. So I think his brother just kept his brother, Paul, kept bailing him out. Right. So he's like, I'm going to create this magazine and I'm going to be able to publish all of my works in it. And kind of I think he was like touting himself. And well, that did not work. And then he tried it a second time. That did not work. And both times his brother, Paul, was the person who was bailing him out. His wife's sister, Marie, she actually married Henley, Henry Herman Har- Harges? Harges? Wow, that's was a tongue up- twister. Yeah, it is. It was not a good time. <laughs> um, and I'm about to marry a Henry, so I better get that right. Um, but he was a partner of J.P. Morgan in Paris. So, like, the family just married money. They found money, they married money, and it sounds like he was, like, the brother-in-law that the daughters, like did not marry the successful guy. Like once his athletic career kind of crapped to the bed, that was all he had going for him. Mm-hmm. So he asked his brother again for money, his brother Paul, and his brother Paul was like, sorry, bro, I am not continuing to bail you out. And he did not like that answer. So oh May 8th, yeah, yeah, that's how it always goes. Mm. On May 8th, 1902, he went to East 77th Street to his brother Paul's apartment in Manhattan and just walked into his brother's library and unfortunately shot his brother. Yikes. And then he turned the gun on himself. The The creepy part here is, of course, that story's awful. Like, you couldn't hack it so your brother wouldn't bail you out yet again. And so mm-hmm. you're going to kill him for it. And then realizing what you've done, there's no way out now. So he mm-hmm. turned the gun on himself. An inquest into this all ruled that it was temporary insanity. This just did not go with who he was. It was kind of like he snapped at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of creepy because a lot of the stories that we looked into, it seems to be across the board. People just kind of lost it out of nowhere and just went insane. Yeah, it's a common theme. Sure, stories like this happen still to this day, right? They, Mm -hmm. You know, people, when it it comes to money, there's always Mm going to be some awful backhanded situation but this was tying back into of course the temporary insanity but both brothers are now buried at sleepy hollow cemetery both of them and i'm sure they're so mad yeah if my brother killed me and i have to be buried next to him yeah Mm -hmm. that also the same cemetery that also seems to be a theme that i was you will see yeah throughout these stories that what is it that even if there is some sort of (laughs) Not even some sort of just like if something like that happens that they're still in the same plot. Like, is that how the way this is that the way this works? Because I don't know, but I know that Dale, Dale's got a doozy of a story for us now that kind of follows the same insanity. So if you want to go ahead and tell us that one, Dale, to jump right in, it's a, a shortened version of this story, but the story is about the strong family and it revolves around the gentleman by the name of Mason R. Strong. He was a 50 year old engineer and architect on Wall Street. Uh, He was very wealthy and he was married. He had a wife and four children and the children age ranges were eight to 16 And the story goes that one day in December of the early 1900s, Strong attacked his entire family with an axe and then killed himself with a razor blade across his throat. What's crazy is the youngest two of the four children, the 14-year-old and the 8-year-old, survived And when they were finally found two days after the murders had occurred, and speculation is that the entire family had been drugged, and that's why they hadn't been found until two days after. And when they arrived at the house, the kids just said, everybody's sick. And so when they went in and discovered this massacre, these two kids were still alive. And also... Kind of a fun fact, this house still stands and it's in. So the house itself is not in Sleepy Hollow. It's on the Passaic in New Jersey. But the victims, as well as the father who killed them, 
they are all buried in the cemetery. And even more interesting, they all share a single plot. So a single headstone bearing all of their names and a single death year, which is that is wild. (laughs) Like, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. Like a father of a family just one day kills three of the people in his family but wanted to kill them all. That's wanted, like, yeah, I think yeah. intended to kill them all, but the two children were just injured and not killed and then kills himself. And then they are all buried in the same family plot. I no words, no words. That one doesn't entirely blow. I mean, like the it doesn't blow my mind because they were children. Mm-hmm. I could see them still being buried with their parents. I mean, Amanda and I have actually seen the yeah. uh, monument uh, or the headstone, whichever yeah. it is, on this plot. And it is all of their names like listed, single file in a row. And when we heard that story, we were kind of like, what? Why, why? Why isn't this father, you know, buried in an unmarked grave like he deserves? That's the thing is, OK, so whatever you may believe, and, and we are clearly people who believe that there is, you know, a ghost, a soul, whatever it may be afterwards that can haunt the crap out of you. Mm-hmm. If I had to be buried next to my husband, who not only killed all of us, and now I'm stuck next to him for eternity. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, also, uh, can you what? imagine the brutality of that murder? Like walking into that house, he killed them with an axe. Mm. And in December, which we've kind of talked about, and I don't remember if this is something that that I had learned on another podcast that I listened to or or what it may be about the story, but they had the heat turned on really high in the house because it was winter and it was cold. So I do just want to point out something very disgusting. Yes. But when the heat is on that high and you have bodies there... For lack of a more appropriate term, rotting Mm -hmm. in high heat, those poor babies waking up in that. And I do just want to play, not devil's advocate, of course, because this guy is the worst. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he drugged them beforehand leads me to believe that, like, this may be one of those situations in that temporary insanity bracket where he, maybe he owed people a bunch of money. Maybe right. he had done something and that he felt like these people are going to kill my family so brutally. I want mm-hmm. to do it so that, that there's no pain. There's something there in that drugging mm-hmm. that, that kind of suggests that like he did not want them to know what was happening to them. Or I might yeah. be reading too much into that. But. And now, the fact that he also killed himself. Like clearly yes. there was some type of I mean, you would hope that there was some type of remorse in what he had just done for him to then slit his throat. Like he very much wanted to not be there anymore. So I not to, not to continue this depression spiral, but the story that now Dina's going to tell us, she's promised to blow our minds with. It. I I am mm. about to blow your. I'm mind. pumped. Okay, I'm we're pumped. ready. I, we're ready. I, I do not mean that literally, as the story I am about to tell you does involve a gunshot. Many people may have heard of a very famous street called Buckout, or I'm sorry, very famous road called Buckout Road. Are either of you familiar with that? I have heard of that. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And it's spelled as it sounds, Mm -hmm. B-U-C-K-O-U-T. Okay. But... There was actually a person with the last name Buck Out, except it was spelled B-U-C-K-H-O-U-T. That to me is like Paris Hilton, like Buck Hot. <laughs> it was so hot. A Buck Hot. <laughs> now that I've ruined the seriousness, let's bring it back to murder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, we if we don't laugh, we have we to cry, have fun, right? right? That's true. So, And he wasn't a great guy. So very different than the stories you guys shared where I would like to think they had a shred of humanity, decency in them at one point and maybe Mm -hmm. something sinister turned that in their brains. Mm -hmm. Buck out, however, was not a man of uh, strong repute. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I shall say he was said to have been an alcoholic, not really much of a worker. I think the money came from more the wife's side of the family. And... With that bit of alcoholism, apparently he also 
couldn't help but believe that his wife was cheating on him and having several indiscretions, which I'm just I'm just seeing the spiral down of this man. Right. And very similarly to what we're hearing again around the holidays, which we all know is a very testy kind of time. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of stress amongst people because the holidays, spending money, being with family, all the things. So technically, the story starts right around Christmas because. Isaac, I believe his first name was Isaac Buckout, went to go play a game of cards and he was he did not win, which I mean, makes no surprise to me. Loser. Right. And yes, he (laughs) was, you know, so immediately he goes to the bad like, right. I must have been cheated. I must something must have happened because how could I lose this money? Right. And he's playing this game with uh, some neighbors that he hasn't isolated yet because most of the people in the area did not like him. And he, he's at this, the house of the Rendles. Uh, and after dinner, they sit around for this game of cards, right? Well, he loses. So he decides to invite them over to his house on New Year's Day. Okay. Well, when he gets, has them there, it's Alfred Rendell, his son, Charles, Buckout's wife. Okay. And they're all like sitting down and he's he's treating them like royalty. He's being oh so kind and then excuses himself from the room. And when he comes back, he has a double barreled shotgun with him. Where he, Fantastic. He, yes. He immediately kills Alfred Rendell. He shoots the son Charles in the when what winds up being his eye that Charles actually survives. And then turn it even more brutal. He crushes his wife's skull with the butt of the gun. What? Okay. Yep. The shit. Because again, his wife could have been cheating on him. Right. No proof. Just. Exactly. He is arrested. Uh, He winds up going through three separate trials, though, before he is actually convicted of murder and then hanged. Can you explain to me why it took three trials? That's wild. Quick question. Is this the one that's considered the Sleepy Hollow Massacre, Dina? Yes. Mm. Yes. This is. uh, So this is very well known and it is printed in the New Yorker, which has a an extremely detailed article, including all the different trials. So to connect it back to your story, Amanda, um, and it's the New Yorker uh, that came out in September of 1935. So Classic. much, much later after the actual events, but mm-hmm. they do a really great job to to really detail the the questions that we're at. Like, how could it take in three trials? And one of the reasons was the same thing, right? They he tried to plead insanity in all three trials. There was the usual conflict of evidence. Uh, two or three doctors uh, and experts from asylums testified that he was sane. Uh, But still, the first jury disagreed, standing eight to four for conviction. What? I also think like this makes me like I think about the women who were put on trial as witches and how like immediately were hung or burned. No trial. Yeah. No trial. One guy. Saying that they were a witch and that was it. And they were tried for, you know, healing people or putting spells on people Mm -hmm. or little things like that. And now we have three stories of men. Pretty horrific. Pretty Mm -hmm. horrific, too. (laughs) Who just lose it a little bit. To bring it back to something Dale said, this is where I'm going to blow your minds right now. So we hear this story and now we have this Buckout Road in White Plains. So again, it's not Sleepy Hollow, but uh, the Buckout, I believe the family are buried in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. So there's our Mm -hmm. connection. But Buckout Road is in White Plains. And it is considered to be one of the most haunted roads in the U.S. Like it's a two mile stretch. Yeah. But there are tons of stories that literally tie back to everything we've already talked about. There is a lady in white apparition on this road yes. of the Ta-da. of Mary Buckout, mm. uh, who was the wife of Captain John Buckout. Different people than we're talking about here, but still where they lived to the age of 130 while Mary passed away 30 years prior. I, I, I 
can't believe that somebody during this time period 130 lived in that to the time age of 130. 200. Yeah. That's yeah. 200 in today's years. Jeez. Um, she and, truly was a lady in white then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the even best, the, the chilling That's because your skin was see-through. <laughs> <laughs> there were apparently witchcraft trials in this area. Yes. So in the 1600s, there were three women who were accused of practicing witchcraft and burned at the stake near this road. So here we have a lady in white. We have three women accused of being witches. And now... My all-time favorite, uh, the curse of albino cannibals. Yes. What? Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So apparently there was this house that I they was lived not ready in. for that sentence. No, I no. just want to let you know I was not prepared. But for I that am sentence. very intrigued. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm shuffling my booty in my chair. I'm ready. Go. <laughs> so there was this house. It was it was I think literally called the Red House. It looked like a, almost like a red barn that was converted into a house that these albino cannibals allegedly lived in. And it is said that if you were to uh, park your car or even drive by and you honked your horn three times, the family would emerge and attack you, tearing you limb from limb. And personally, I think that's just myth to get you not to honk your horn while Mm -hmm. driving on these streets. But Mm. the house was destroyed by a fire, so it does not stand anymore. But kids at these local high schools, right, White Plains, Sleepy Hollow, uh, they apparently really like to play pranks and honk their horns and bang on the doors. And one night, a a teen apparently even attempted to put an M80 in their mailbox, but... Well, that's rude. Allegedly found a decapitated head of a child. Oh. Inside said mailbox. Right. I'm sorry. I mean, that's where you what? put. That's where you put heads. Right. That's a good spot. So okay. I feel like the buckouts kind of started all of this legends of hauntings and things like that, and it's all tying back to this road. And I feel like it really does connect Sleepy Hollow with White Plains, which really kind of brings that Westchester County area oh, together. Totally agree. So spooky. in such a happy way. Yeah, great. I just what didn't think like connection. one story could tie together I, our past episodes like that. Yeah. I was like, you're joking. That's beautiful. That's incredible. And you know, back to what we spoke to up top, and I think we'll sp- speak more on this after our story time, is there is a, there's so many hauntings and, and stories of hauntings and crazy stories of people that are buried in the cemetery or lived around the area. And you can look up a much larger city or town in New York and you are not going to get a third of the creepiness that you can get when looking up Sleepy Hollow. But to tie these all together, just to, again, like we're, we're not just here like going, hey, did you hear about this? Hey, did you hear about that? <laughs> right. How how do these things keep happening yeah. in such a gruesome like fashion? A Something's yeah. pulling it. Yeah. And with Sleepy Hollow being such a small town, mm-hmm. right? It, it, it seems hard to believe yeah. that these things would keep happening in such a small town over and over without some sort of... Transcending centuries. Yeah. That's the, yeah. the crazy part. It's mm-hmm. This is not like this all happened in a 50-year period. This is We're dating back to the 1600s and we just mm-hmm. keep going. And we yeah. haven't talked about more modern stories, uh, you know, out of respect for the families. And some of them are really quite, quite gruesome. And horrific. Yeah. And, Agreed. and if you Agreed. want to look up, there, there's a great website that we stumbled upon. He does a great article. The website's called Odd Things I've Seen. And the article was written by J.W. Ocker. He writes um, macabre travelogues and some spooky kids books. But the website's all about spooky things that he finds in his travels. And he kind of says, like, it's palpable. Like, you go to this place, it is palpable. There is an energy mm. there. And uh, this kind of proves it. There definitely is something about it. And, you know, as someone who frequents it every weekend as of right now, I mean, I like to put a positive spin on it because I sure. love going there. Right. I've now infected Dayel mm-hmm. and kidnapped her. Yes. And brought <laughs> her and dragged and her I there. And I can't wait to go back. <laughs> See? So, like, for people like us, 
it's almost like we we want to remember the dead. We want to we yeah. want to know what really did happen, as Amanda said at the beginning, to honor these memories. Right. So telling their stories. Yes. Yeah, so our our facts yeah. might be off base at certain times because unfortunately we're kind of at the mercy of the internet, you know, to find and discover, God bless people like, you know, the New York Times and the New Yorker that really archive their uh, publications. But it's very hard to to fact check this stuff in and to really yeah. dive deep. I mean, hello, something in, what did I say, 1870. Yeah. Right? I mean, they didn't have the yeah. kind of records that we no. have now. So it, it's very hard sure. to figure this out. And that's why we definitely encourage um, people to give us that information. Let us know what you hear, you know. Yeah. Do, and your, do your own research too. Look yeah. into it and tell us if you've and share it with us. These yeah. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. want to hear these. We want to know. I want to know if somebody has traveled down Buckout Road and seen anything creepy. Okay, dear listeners, we are going to take a quick break, and when we get back, our favorite part of the podcast: story time. Is your January looking dry? Get some lotion. Get a humidifier, and better yet. Get Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices across local stores to get the best price on a huge selection of drinks perfect for dry January. Every single time. Non-alcoholic wines? Have a look. Ready-made mocktails? Grab a straw and order them up. Beer without the alcohol? (laughs) Yep, take your pick. You can find all of them here, in the app, in that phone that's in your hand. Could it be any simpler? Nope, not a chance. So shop for great deals on all your dry January beverages or other drinks and get them delivered to your door or blanket fort, maybe. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. And don't forget to lotion up your elbows. They're looking a little dry. Welcome back, residents of Folktown. Are Dale and Dina, are you guys ready for our favorite part? Yes. Yes, please. I am. Yes. All right. So cozy up, dear listener, because once again, it's story time. Deep within the heart of Sleepy Hollow, an enigmatic tale wafts through the cool evening air. It is a tale of the Whitmore family, once vibrant and full of life, but who vanished on a night drenched in fog and mystery. The Whitmores were the picture of happiness. Charles, the family patriarch, his radiant wife Isabel, and their two children, young Nathaniel and the ever-curious Eleanor. They resided in a stately manor, nestled close to the woods, a stone's throw away from the town's hauntingly beautiful cemetery. On a particular hollow's eve, with the moon at its fullest, they held a grand celebration of their residence. Songs, laughter, and tales of old echoed across rooms. But as midnight approached, a mysterious fog crept upon the land. The ever-thickening mist seemed to have a life of its own. As tales of ancient spirits and legends of the hollow were traded, a chilling breeze swept through, extinguishing every flame in the Whitmore Manor. Chaos erupted. The guests, blinded by the dense fog and gripped by fear, scrambled for an exit. When the fog had finally lifted, a grim realization set in. The Whitmore family was nowhere to be found. Decades turned into centuries, and tales of spectral figures began to emerge. On Hollow's Eve, under the silvery glow of the moon, shadows resembling the Whitmore family could be seen meandering through the cemetery, their laughter soft and distant, carried with the wind. Curious adventurers who dared to venture close spoke of otherworldly encounters. Nathaniel playing with a ghostly dog. Eleanor holding a bouquet of luminous wildflowers. 
Charles and Isabel dancing silently to a tune only they could hear. A lingering aroma of lavender and a sensation of coldness marked their spectral presence. Hushed voices from the mist seemed to plead with the living, unveil our tale and release our souls. The Whitmore enigma remains. Were they ensnared by the spirits of old? Transported to another realm by forces beyond comprehension? Or does a more earthly mystery await its revelation? In the folds of Sleepy Hollow's history, the Whitmore's are an enigmatic chapter. If you ever wander the cemetery on an eve such as theirs, tune your ears to the wind. Amongst the rustling leaves and the night's whispers, you might catch a fragment of their timeless story. A story yearning for an end. Rest well, dear listener, and may the tales of Sleepy Hollow not disturb your peaceful slumber. That was another great spooky story. I love it. I feel like they're getting scarier for me. Because I'm it's real and more <laughs> mysterious. Do you think any of these people are haunting the cemetery today? I absolutely Because these are horrific, horrific murders. Yes. So there's got to be some hauntings. This movie has nothing to do with what we're talking about, uh, uh, like plot wise, but The Grudge. Do you ever see The Grudge back in the day? Yes. But that that's an old that's yeah. a throwback. Yeah. Back. yeah, right. yeah. But there throwback. was something in that movie that always really stuck with me. Right. Because it's a Japanese legend. Yeah. Right. A folktale. And I lo- are based on a folktale, which is kind of what we're talking about now. Mm-hmm. And it basically is saying that if you die in a rage, right, you have all of this anger, your soul can't rest. True. So mm-hmm. look at the people that we've spoken about, the Strongs, the Buckouts. What what was the the Fords, right, that Amanda spoke yeah. about? I don't believe for a second so that true. they have been able to cross over. Yeah. Because what they did was so malicious yeah. that they have to pay one way well, or another, right? Well, and I think they, like, do. they have unfinished business, right? Like, especially the families that we've talked about, there were kids, you know, like how, oh, you know, know, one minute you are living your life and the next it's you're gone. And so I can only imagine being tied to a place because of that. Mm -hmm. and wanting more and then staying. And if you think about how many residents are in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery on top of the old Dutch church burying ground, which has been there since 1695. I mean, that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. And like probably even more than we know or have records for. I think that's another thing is we don't necessarily have all the records of who's even buried there. Right, because there are unmarked graves. Yeah, which is even more interesting. And a lot of woods in the Rockefeller Preserve yes. that yes. Yes, that could lead yeah, yeah. to more. Okay, Dale, don't you have a really creepy, weird story? Yeah, I do. So basically, this is a special from the New York Times, and it goes as this woman who is a Slavic woman, she delivers milk. She is driving down a road and she comes across a body, a body that has been stabbed. She also notices that the knife is laying right next to the body. She obviously continues on her way. She goes into the town. She finds a butcher that she knows, tells the butcher that she found this body. The butcher then goes to the police and tells the police. The police then go back to the woman and try to convince her to take them to where she found this body. Where was they the do, body? Uh, so the body was at a farm, the front of a farm, or the entrance of a farm, Duck Farm, on mm. John D. Rockefeller's estate. So they go back to where said body is supposed to be. However, the body's not there. Of course it's not. It, oh, Right. It's not there. So she obviously is like, well, the body was there. And also he was very well dressed and had a brand new pair of shoes on. 
So where is this body? That's an important fact. Where is this body? And Good shoes. The police believe that the body had been taken and thrown into the fields somewhere on the Rockefeller's estate, never to be found again. There's no stories. There's no there's no case file. Nothing like literally there's nothing out there except for what this article. To her? She goes about her just merry way. Goes, she just goes back to delivering milk, except an even weirder twist to this story is one day she's on the same road again. And a random guy jumps out at her and tries to attack her, but she okay. fights back and gets away. And then from that day forward, she carries a revolver. And that's the end of the story. My girl. My girl. You know what I'm picturing? Because it, you said he was well-dressed and new shoes. First off, I don't understand how this woman could have figured out these shoes were new. Picked up on that. Okay. But... I mean, it's the Rockefeller estate. So what if it was someone that was like stumbling out of this area, like a friend? I guess it wouldn't be a friend because then they would have reported him missing. There would have been some sort of... You would think. (gasps) Wait, hold on. I'm making up a story. Yeah. I'm making up a story, guys. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. He's at a party at the Rockefeller estate, right? That's what I'm picturing. Shit's getting wild. Yep. Yep. Maybe some illegal drugs are going around. Something's getting a little crazy, you know? The hooch is flowing. It's flowing and he trips and falls and hits his head Mm. and dies. And they're like, yeah, we can't have this here. Like we're big people. We're the Rockefellers. So he, we we think he's dead. We're just going to go dump his body because we Mm. can't be having people dying at this party. That's illegal with all these illegal things. And so they go to dump his body, but then the motherfucker wakes up Mm -hmm. and "Ah!" And they kill him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But they just had a knife on them. Sure, but, it's the but 1900s, <laughs> maybe. To, I don't know. To bring it back to that point, how do you leave the murder weapon? Yeah, that's it, real dumb. You left in a hurry. Somebody messed but, up. But then, but then, when the police show up, the body is gone. The murder weapon is gone. It's right. almost like I did it. Say, did and it say something no, like maybe there's like blood or something? Yeah, there was obvious signs of blood. Mm-hmm. So like there was a body there. Okay, and so then, they know she wasn't crazy. But then also, here's another. Like twist maybe is who was the guy that attacked her? <laughs> I was don't even he laugh. was he involved? This woman's a magnet and for this. didn't want her to say anything. Or maybe yeah, because I she's the only true. she's the only witness to the body. She's the one that found the body. She was the only one that saw the body. Mm-hmm. The police officers think saw something. the blood, but they did not see the body. Maybe he was somebody of power, and that's why there was no follow-up articles and things like that. And they tried to take her out. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you for coming to this episode of Dateline. (laughs) (laughs) 1900s edition. I'm so glad she got away. And, you know, but still, you know, talking about the hauntings. I mean, just yet Mm -hmm. another body Mm -hmm. amongst the pile. That's never been explained. Another one that, uh, this one's actually kind of awful, but there's (laughs) the um, Armour Steiner's House of Odiferous Guests. Oh, I've been there. Okay, have you heard about this? There's a ghost that exudes an exquisite and unidentifiable fa- fragrance, according to a passage in a book written by a poet and historian, Carl Carmer. The ghost's identity is unknown, but they think it might be um, Aliko Lilius, a Finnish writer, or the woman who he lived with, who was a 20th century lady pirate who made a fortune plundering the vessels of the China Seas. Get it, girl. What? The theories have also arisen that the ghost is Paul J. Armour, the New York banker who built the house in 1860, or Joseph Steiner. I think they're just really throwing anything at the wall to see where it sticks. Mm-hmm. But the whole thing is the ghost has this like very um, intense fa- fragrance yes. that like people don't really see anything or hear anything, but mm. they are smelling the scent for what? This was 1860, so... I did hear that on the tour that I, I had went on. Uh, first off, that house is pretty incredible uh, to go look at it because it's the octagon house. It's it's in the shape oh, of an octagon, first that's off. That's wild. It is. And uh, you can't go like all the way to the top, but you can go very, very high. And uh, they also have a white lady that haunts that area. <gasps> bum, Love bum, it. Bum. Yeah. Dina, can you tell us about the bronze lady of Sleepy Hollow Oh, I sure can. Because, you know, bringing up everything that is Sleepy Hollow really ties back to the cemetery. But 
it's strange though, because we're talking about so many things that, and probably leaving so many things out from the 1600s, the 1700s, right? 1800s. The Sleepy Hollow Cemetery wasn't even built until 1849. But like many of these things predate the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery actually for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the, the Strongs, the Rendles, right? They are in the Sleepy Hollow Center Cemetery, but no one said that that's when the hauntings began. Right. It's true. Mm-hmm. You know, with Washington Irving having written The Legend of Sleepy Hollow in 1819. Right. There's mm-hmm. still all of these. Irish lore and German lore and, of course, the Native Americans that were there first that had their own stories and legends, right? Oh, totally. So now we have the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery that forms and then we have these elaborate mausoleums being built, right, in the the northern part of the cemetery. In the northern part of the cemetery, we have the Rockefellers. Then across the way is the Archbalds. And then kind of next to them, semi behind them, is the mausoleum for the Civil War General Samuel Thomas. Now, his mausoleum is is very plain, I'd say, for the most part. And not to knock him, you know, like everything doesn't have to always be elaborate. It's not like you're going to look at it. But he decided, actually his wife decided, to have this statue commissioned and she is now known as the bronze lady and she's kind of gotten she's we saw referred to as another legend yes of sleepy hollow because of all of these things so when general thomas's wife commissioned the uh the sculptor andrew o'connor jr to create this it kind of has a funny story that still could kind of tie into this whole like unhappiness feeling as to why curses or hauntings happen. Yeah. Because she had it. I'm sorry. I can't help but laugh because it's kind of ridiculous. But she had it built almost to kind of like look over his mausoleum. Yeah. Right. Watch and, him. Yeah. But like I, I think also to to mourn for him. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. O'Connor makes this beautiful statue uh, and and gives it even a name that is, in my opinion, possibly French. I can't pronounce it because I will probably ruin it, but it means grief. And so she seems sad. Well, the wife didn't like that. She wanted her to be happier. And I kid you not, the story goes that Andrew O'Connor decided to make a new head that oh was God. more appealing to the wife. <laughs> and I and she liked it and then he smashed it on the ground and was like no no that will never be on on the statue that's oh wild my God. <laughs> so i mean i'm with him i think it's supposed to show grief many angels are usually crying or sad melancholy right so the statues across the way back in the 60s and 70s before obviously the cemetery got locked because of all of this, right? People got to ruin it for everybody. Yep. The cemetery was actually a big kind of uh, party spot. It was a hangout. Yeah, it was a hangout. I so, totally would have done that. I just want to point that out. I, I totally would have hung out in the cemetery. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I've what, done it. Are there street lights? No. Yeah, that's a, that, we've talked about that kind of dark. Super yeah. dark and creepy. Mm-hmm. The best. So I feel like, Dale, you had found some of the... Stories from real people yeah. who had messed with this statue. Yes. The bronze lady and the creepy like ghost stories that kind of go along with the bronze lady. A lot of them are like little kids and then different generations of those kids coming back to the cemetery and doing the same thing. But it goes that there was if you go into the cemetery, if you wander into the cemetery at night and you creep amongst the tombstones and the mausoleums, you'll find the bronze lady, obviously. What is said is if you climb onto the bronze lady's lap and Rude. you slap her face. Why? I don't hate know. that. I don't know why. Every story that I could find is either someone hitting her in the face or slapping her in the face. And then after doing that, you go over and you look into the mausoleum like little people, door, like people. the keyhole. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. If you 
see somebody, it is said to be the bronze lady and you'll be cursed with bad luck. And what's crazy about that is there was a woman who actually experienced going and sitting on the bronze lady. She not only slapped the bronze lady's um, (laughs) face, but she also kicked the bronze lady's shins. She deserves everything bad that's about to happen to her. Then went over and, you know, continued on and did the whole looking through. She believed that, like, it was just a stupid little kid's, like, tail. Didn't think anything of it. However, two or three days later, there was, like, a crazy storm. And her car was hit and crushed by a tree limb falling on it. And I wish so she was she, in the from car. that moment was like, Mm-mm, nope, that is just because it wasn't the same day or like the moment she yeah. left the cemetery. I yeah. think coincidental. But I also found it interesting that in her story, she was very much like she didn't. She automatically was like, oh, no, that was because I did that. Like that I mean, is from that. Yeah. Bad luck is bad luck. I'll add to that and say. That I had read that if you knock on the door, like you had said. Yes. And like again, three it's three times. It, right. Like it's either once or three times. And I, I get that three number, I feel like very much comes up when it when we're talking about like the devil, things yes. like that. Right. Like three. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Yep. And that uh, you'll have bad dreams that night. And I find that funny because I can have bad dreams no matter what. But that comes with stress, I don't need right? Help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. Need I don't help. need help. Yeah, exactly. But the the idea of like hearing the bronze lady crying or that she'd uh, cry tears of blood, I yes. I want to re- I want to relate that back again to the wife Ann Thomas. So she had uh, passed away in 1944 and joined her husband in the mausoleum. She was a hundred years old when she passed. Okay. Basically 700. Yeah, got it. People said that it was because she insulted the bronze lady, originally saying that she should have been like happier. Mm, Yeah. That that is why this spookiness started. And then when she was entombed, now that she's kind of facing the bronze lady, (laughs) it was like adding insult to injury almost. I mean, I just, I thought. I thought that was like insane to hear that. That's yeah. interesting. And you know, mm-hmm. I will say that this is the thing. So this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these types of stories, when it comes to Sleepy Hollow, Terrytown, that whole area, literally the tip of the iceberg. Like when we tell you we could not pick just a couple stories, I yeah. highly recommend you do your own research because We'll keep saying it again and again. Go visit the town. Go check out the cemetery. Go check out the Octagon House. Go check out the Old Dutch Church. These places, we can't describe to you how it feels to be there. But if you go, especially if you go on this recommendation, you've never been, please, please tell us because I want yeah, to we hear all know. of your stories. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We're just scratching and at the surface. Barely. Barely scratching at the surface yeah. of this one. It's a, it's a tickle. I think the Bronze Lady is a beautiful spot to end this episode. It's also a beautiful spot to see. Like, the view is phenomenal. It's so beautiful. It's a beautiful view. And honestly, the statue is quite impressive. It's It's gorgeous. The fact that it's, yeah, it's really beautiful. We'll post some pictures of it on our socials. So do you just want to say head over to Folktown Podcast on Instagram, Facebook. Follow us. Share your creepy stories with us. Like I said, we We want to hear them. them. And head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a follow, rate us, review us. We love it. We want to hear your feedback and we're really excited for next week. It's a little bit of a sad episode because it is the final episode of Folktown Chapter 1 Sleepy Hollow. But we are bringing the heat next week. It is all about Washington Irving and of course the legend of the Headless Horseman. The reason Mm -hmm. we all even started looking into this little sleepy town. Okay, residents of Folktown, we will see you next week with the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.